today I have the pleasure about talking about my favorite topic here at PDAC 2022, and that is uranium. Why is everybody talking about uranium at PDAC this year? No, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of excitement about uranium uh, at this conference this year. Uh, a, a big part of it is just the uh, the move to decarbonize and to go to cleaner sources of electricity. Uh, nuclear power, of course, is uh, you know provides clean, uh, carbon-free, baseload electricity. And as uh, as he was saying, uh, the spot price of uranium has risen sig uh, significantly this year. And our company, we've actually seen uh, uh, utilities start to move back into the long-term market, which for us, I think, is a very bullish signal. Fantastic. And of course, one of my favorite things, I tell everybody out at Investor Intel Land, grab your CEO, grab them in the elevator and give them 90 seconds to pitch why you should buy our stock. And on that note, I'm going to throw it at you, John. You got 60 seconds to tell us why your uranium company is one we should be looking at on our watch list. Well, thanks, Tracy. My name is John Bay. I'm the CEO of Standard Uranium. So Standard Uranium is an early stage exploration company. All our projects are in the Athabasca Basin of Saskatchewan. We are early stage, but what we're looking for is to make that next high-grade basement hosted discovery. Now you're wondering, where are we? Well, actually our flagship project, our Davidson River, is in the southwest corner, right next door to Fission's Triple R and NextGen's Arrow. What we're looking for is to find that Arrow 2.0 on our project. And our project actually sits on the same Patterson Lake conductor which runs right through. We're starting our third drill program right now, drilling all summer, so it's exciting times for investors of Standard Uranium. I'll tell you, we have John kicking my you-know-what this morning. Excellent. <laughs> and on that note, uh, who will I ask next? I'm going to throw it back at you because you did such a beautiful job, Curtis. This is, of course, Curtis Moore from Energy Fuels. Give us 60 seconds on why Energy Fuels, a producer of of course, uranium in the United States is a company we should be watching. Absolutely, Tracy, thank you. Yeah, Energy Fuels is producing the raw materials that make many clean energy technologies possible. Uh, we've traditionally been a uh, producer of uranium. We've been the largest uranium producer in the United States for the last several years. We have a number of projects that are fully permitted, ready to go, fully developed. Uh, and right now we're in the process of ramping those up to start uh, capturing this uh, market we're in. Uh, but what's particularly exciting for us as well is that just in the last couple of years, we have realized that we could be a significant U.S. producer of rare earth elements. Uh, the, the reason for this is that uh, many, if not all, rare earth elements, when they come out of the uh, ground, uh, the minerals also contain uranium and thorium. They're, they're, they have low levels of natural radioactivity. We have a facility in southeast Utah called the White Mesa Mill that has the licenses and permits and our, the expertise to actually process those, uh, those minerals and recover the rare earth elements, also recover the uranium and sell that into the nuclear industry. So uh, yeah, it's a great time to, to be a shareholder of uh, energy fuels for sure. And of course, you may not know this, but I fell in love with uranium due to Dr. Richard Spencer from U308. Do you introduce me to uranium, what, a dozen years ago? Well, I certainly didn't know that, uh, Tracy, but I'll take it. Thanks very much. <laughs> so could you tell us what's happening with U308 right now? U308 Corp has got an amazing deposit uh, that is a mixture of uranium and battery commodities. So as all the car industry moves across to the lithium ferric phosphate battery, we've got the iron phosphate that's the component of, of that battery. So it went from a project that was absolutely uranium orientated for the clean energy space. And as, as the, the guys mentioned, I mean, everyone's talking about net zero. You cannot get to net zero without, without nuclear. And uh, so we've got a, 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 a foot in both markets, both the, the, the products, the primary products for the one kind of lithium battery that's thermally stable, that doesn't catch a light, and the uranium on the, on the other side. And you know, what's the fundamental driver of the uranium space at the moment is the small modular reactors. And to see companies like uh, Samsung going out and talking about floating nuclear reactors, things that you can move around to where you need the power, just absolutely phenomenal. So we're starting to take off on the fundamentals of, of uranium, despite all this Russian stuff. Beside that, there's this huge driver for the clean energy. And of course, Tom Drivers from Appia Rare Earths and Uranium. Uh, Appia has a large uranium resource in Nelio Lake, Ontario, uh, approximately 55 million pounds of uh, uh, 4301 uh, 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 compliant resource. 
and um, that's in uh, in fair and in indicated category. In addition to that, we've got about 180 million pounds of uranium uh, of rare earth, sorry, in 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 the same uh, 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 deposit. In addition to that, we have uh, four properties in the Athabasca Basin or around the Athabasca Basin, uh, looking for, uh, and our model is high-grade uh, uranium uh, near surface, uh, and and and. Uh, so, uh, and near infrastructure. So, and, and uh, also, uh, API has these rare earths uh, uh, and uh, high grade rare earths uh, uh, that we're working on Alces Lake, uh, one of the uh, highest uh, uh, so far, what we've seen, it's one of the highest grade uh, uh, monazite uh, uh, rare earth of uh, 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 NDPR. Uh, Critical rare earth deposit uh, or, or project in um, in North America, and um, so there's a lot of things uh, to uh, look for uh, for in, uh, for investors to get excited, and and we're quite excited about the Apia uh, story in terms of both uranium and rare earths. Of course, I've noticed subtle marketing and branding for uranium all over the PDAC walls, okay, with Sprott's got his uranium trust. You know, talk to me, do you think the Sprott fund made a difference, Curtis? Absolutely, absolutely. It basically swept up a whole bunch of excess inventories that were floating around the market, being traded around and, and keeping the price depressed. So uh, I don't know what the number is, but I believe Sprott has, 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 has purchased about 40 or 50 million pounds of uranium just on the open market. Uh, investors are putting money into the Sprott Fund. They have an ATM, which allows them to raise more money to go buy more uranium. And uh, yeah, basically they're competing against U.S. utilities for this uranium, and it's, and it's definitely provided uh, some nice uplift in the, price of, in the price of the commodity. And of course, Richard or Dr. Spencer, I don't mean to give you all the difficult questions, but let's talk about the geopolitical issues around uranium, which should cause North American sources of uranium to actually escalate for interest by investors. Do you not agree with what's going on out there? Absolutely. I, you know, it's, it's staggering that we're at this point where anyone, any man in the street could have recognized 15 years ago that the U.S. was getting so much of its uranium and its enriched uranium from, from Russia. And Russia controls about two-thirds of the world's uranium resources just in having good relationships with the countries that have those resources. So, you know, this was, it was perfectly obvious what was going to happen. Um, and you know now we're in the situation where it's happened. Europe has done the same thing with with its gas from from Russia. Russia turned off the taps a number of times, and and you know everyone thought it was going to be different the next time. So we are in this geopolitical crisis at at the moment, which is as horrific as it is. It's really good for the uranium space, and I think that the the Western world, Europe, and and the U.S. will finally get it that. They have to have their own supply of, of these fundamental elements for clean energy. And you know, you cannot be talking about clean energy and all the solar power and all the rest of it without having nuclear as the 24-7 driver of those, those, those uh, systems to compensate for, for the weather and all that. So, you know, I, I feel that irrespective of what the uranium price is today, the fundamentals are so incredibly exciting. And, you know, in, I, I don't remember how old the um, sort of power infrastructure is of North America. I seem to remember it's 50 years old. It's not particularly stable. It's not politically correct to go out and build more power lines um, because it's not exciting for the politicians. So I think we're going to end up in a situation that as that system fails, we're going to be looking at sort of smaller local grids that are going to be driven by uh, small modular reactors, or at least the small modular reactors will be the backbone of that, and solar and wind and everything coming into that. So, you know, we're going to have these sort of independent power cells, and, you know, the small modular re reactors are just perfect for that. So the uranium fundamentals have never been better, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I know, I've just opened a barrel of fish here. Who would like to go in next? Sure. Well, Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, adding on to Dr. Spencer's comments there, I think it's very telling 
that in the United States, the Nuclear Energy Institute, which is the, the, the trade association, the industry trade association for U.S. utilities, has actually come out and been, uh, become in favor of weaning ourselves off of uh, Russia. Because as you were saying, Russia controls a big chunk of the uranium and enrichment supply. I believe they control about 40 or 45 percent of global uranium enrichment, about 40 percent of global conversion. Uh, they, they've got their fingers in a lot uh, in, a, in a lot of the world. And so I do think that it's uh, very smart from a geopolitical standpoint to kind of reduce that uh, dependence uh, on, on Russian uranium, for sure. In addition to that, um, even uh, Eastern European countries are looking to uh, 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 looking for uranium uh, outside of Russia. So not only the Western world, uh, U.S. And, and, and the Western world uh, utilities, uh, they want to uh, basically uh, get away from uh, getting supply or uranium supply from Russia, but also the Eastern European countries. Now they're looking at sort of uh, uh, different uh, suppliers. So that's in addition to that. Uh, and as you, you mentioned, uh, these uh, the small uh, nuclear reactors, I was at a, a breakfast meeting with the Saskatchewan, uh, 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 the Saskatchewan ministry had uh, today, and SRC is looking at uh, uh, getting the first rea uh, small reactor in Saskatchewan before the uh, uh, 2030. So up and running. So uh, things are, are moving in the right direction. Well, of course, when uh, Appia was tied in with the SRC, your stock looked like a hockey stick. Now back to you, Mr. Bay. Yes. Let's talk about Canada as well. So. We are talking about small modular reactors as the future of energy for, for nuclear in Canada. And we're seeing uh, you know, Ontario, Saskatchewan, uh, Alberta, and New Brunswick all moving forward with small modular reactors. Now they're going with the GE Hitachi 300 megawatt uh, power plant. They're going to build that in Ontario first by 2028, and then Saskatchewan's going to have four. The first one in Saskatchewan by 2030, and then by 2035, they're going to have four operating in Saskatchewan. Now, isn't that amazing? The place where uranium is being mined is actually going to be powered by, by nuclear. That's fantastic. And we're going to see that going all across the U.S. as well. Right now in Wyoming, um, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are behind Terra Energy. They're putting a small modular reactor right on top of a coal-fired power plant, replacing that right into the grid, training the workforce, and they're going to prove the model there and then roll it across the U.S., hopefully taking out coal-fired reactors across the U.S. Now that is exciting. John, that is, that's so exciting. To use that existing infrastructure for the coal, wipe out the coal and just put the small modular reactor there, just link it up with, with the grid, just spectacular Brilliant. idea, fantastic idea. On top of that, I mean, we're seeing large nuclear buildouts across the globe as well. We're seeing Japan talking about bringing their nuclear power plants back online. We're seeing England announce, you know, large factories as well as small modular reactors. France is announcing big reactor builds as well as small modular. And then Korea is coming on with more, India. And it's happening all over the globe. And Eastern Europe. And Eastern Europe. I mean, everybody except for Germany. Germany hasn't quite figured it out yet, but uh, I think their population is going to be pretty tired of paying really expensive for their natural gas coming from, from Russia. This is our infrastructure for the future. Please go to these websites. We have Dr. Richard Spencer, Spencer from U308. Go to these websites because they have the real data you're seeking to make intelligent choices about investing. We have, of course, Tom Drivis from Apia Rare Earths and Uranium. We have Curtis Moore from Energy Fuels. And we have John Bay from Standard Uranium. Go to their websites, and if you have any further questions, send it to us, and we'll get you redirected. Thank you.